Hey, I'm Brianna with Wolfdog Buses. This is Kiara, and we're gonna show you the Voyager. So the Voyager is the first bus I ever built out, and I built this before I even knew that schoolies were a thing, or there was a whole community based around it. Um, which, by the way, the community around schoolies is phenomenal, and I was so happy to find that out. I originally bought a bus because, from my experience growing up in Michigan, um, I knew that these had really beefy motors and the 5.9 Cummins is nearly bulletproof. And then in the early 90s, they were full mechanical and just about everything on them is simple to fix. So I wanted a bus that I could drive around the entire United States and not worry whether I was in a city by dealerships or if I was in the middle of North Dakota, hundreds of miles away from anything. With that being said, I was fortunate in that in the 20,000 miles I've put on this bus in the past few years, um, I've only needed uh, help mechanically once, and that was in the middle of nowhere, Oregon, where I had one of my brake chambers, um, the diaphragm started leaking, so I lost pressure in my air brakes, and I couldn't release my brakes, so I was stuck on the side of the road, unable to move, and I called a semi-truck repair mechanic, which are 24 hours and generally mobile, um, down in Crescent, Oregon. And Jamie from Loop Semi Truck Repair was out there in about 30 minutes, fixed the entire thing with all parts he had on hand, and had me moving and I believe it was under an hour and a half. So it gave me just enough time to make dinner in my rig. Um, so super well worth it having a rig that's easy to work on because if you are traveling, that's your main concern. No matter how new your rig is, no matter how few miles, breaking down can happen and you want to make sure that it's manageable when it happens. So getting to the actual bus, uh, this bus I bought pre-painted. It came from a limousine company, so to speak. It was called Jump on the Bus uh, down in Santa Barbara, California, and they did a house black paint job on it. And I have gone ahead and maintained that. So every year I sand it down, um, touch it up, and then I keep this black, black paint. And I've liked it because when I do go on two tracks or fire service roads that are probably a little sketchier than I should go on with this bus, um, and I scratch it up, all I have to do is sand it down, rattle can black on it, good to go. I did upgrade the lights to LEDs because I want to make sure I can actually see when driving at night. and a lot of the old buses and trucks and Jeeps for that matter come with those really dim halogens that um, just aren't safe when you have oncoming traffic with really bright lights. After I finished the conversion, I replaced the steer tires, which is referring to the front tires. And I went ahead and got Toyo traction tires. They are um, the higher end that you can get. And I did that because this is one of your bigger safety features on your bus. If you're running old tires or dry rotted or something that can pop, uh, that's one of the worst accidents you can have on a bus. So I got these to be safe. And then I also went ahead and talked with a couple of my friends that I know who do drive semi trucks because they have training on what to do in certain situations on a big rig. And what I found interesting is that if you do have a tire pop, uh, you actually wanna do the exact opposite of your instincts. And instead of slamming your brakes, you want to actually hit the gas and shift all your weight distribution backwards so that you can regain control. And once you regain control, um, you shift over to the shoulder or wherever you can that's most out of the way and then slow down. Um, things like that are super important. And I think that if you're driving a schoolie um, bus or big rig in any sense, even if it's an RV, you should really look into what to do in certain bad situations because it's always better to be prepared. Uh, moving on, I kept the original bus door. Uh, you'll see with my bus that I kept almost everything stock that I could. I thought it was super cool having a school bus um, as my RV because I think they're nostalgic and I loved it. Um, great mo memories from goofing around as a kid and I thought the bus doors were cool. So I just went ahead and made my door um, all one solid piece so it opened like a house door. I put a deadbolt on it and I had to beef out the door with a piece of metal so that it would actually latch and then put a door handle on. And that's all I did. I wanted to try and keep the look as much as possible. Uh, coming up next,
I use this bus mainly to go snowboarding, um, camping with friends, or like floating on the river. And so I wanted an outside table that I wouldn't have to like haul out and unfold. So I made this guy that just flips up locks in place and I could go ahead and put my grill up there for tailgating. I could put a speaker here and then I went ahead and installed an outlet so that I can charge my phone, speakers, um, plug in a little air pump for the raft and uh, that really makes the outside of the rig more usable for and practical when you are camping or living in it wherever you're at. Next you'll see this is my hookup for shore power which I basically never use because uh, I did make my bus off-grid ready and I made it super capable in the winter. So um, even with only a thousand watts roughly of solar up top and a very small battery bank, I was able to run off-grid and I think the lowest temperature I went was negative six degrees and that was in Park City, Utah. And I was still maintaining at 75 degrees inside and had heated floors, was more than comfortable. and. Um, yeah, no complaints there. So shore power plug never gets used. Uh, next you'll see this beefy exhaust. Um, this is venting for what I, when I originally had an incinerating toilet in here. I'll talk to you more about that on the inside. Uh, I did switch down the road to a composting. So um, yeah, I have a few things to say about the incinerators. See, I added on a really beefy tailgate. So my original intention was to be able to tailgate with it and put the um, grill out here and maybe a cooler or something. But it turns out that I used the front area more and the rear, I ended up using this for um, hauling stuff, just like you would a truck bed. So I would quick haul the paddle boards or kayaks on here, um, anything heavy that I didn't want to put into my truck. Um, this became really useful for things like that. And then I also have a trailer hitch on it because I did intend to um, flat tow a vehicle. Uh, I did not think that I would be able to get to all the places I wanted to with a 34 foot school bus, but it turns out that you can, um, especially with dualies and having tire chains, you can make it just about anywhere as long as you can make the turns. Um, I did put a backup camera with sensors. Um, I think the sensors are super important because it's one thing to have the visual indication, but as you're checking the front sides, your tail whip, it's nice to have that backup of uh, the alarm and the beeping coming at you if you get a little too close to something. Uh, that's definitely come in handy more than once. And then to abide by the FMVSS, I went ahead and put a solar powered light above my license plate. Um, some people forget about that. Uh, you do technically have to have a light on your license plate at night, and that was a really quick means to get that done. Around the back corner, I did a beefier hose bib. Um, I use this to wash my dog, so I wanted something that was more like a standard hose sprayer rather than the dinky RV ones. So I do have to store the hose separately, but I get the hot cold and I get the nice sprayer. Um, which is more than useful, especially when you have a um, snow dog type breed that does not like baths. That makes it easier. Standard RV water fill, um, bunch of stowage underneath. Stowage on the back side and on the front. This houses my favorite appliance. So in here is the boiler of the Aqua Hot 450D. Uh, this unit is incredible. Aqua Hot and Rickson both make one. And this basically is my hot water, my heated floors, and my climate control in my rig. So since the date I installed this, I have not turned it off. It means it's been on for about three years straight now. Awesome system. It sits on diesel and the 12 volt power it uses is only for the fans in the blower and a recirculation pump inside, as well as an LED light on the control screen. So barely any power, barely any diesel, and I can basically turn the inside into a sauna if I want. Um, it's amazing. Highly recommend these things, especially if you're trying to have a winter rig. Um, yeah, 
love it. And I can have on-demand hot water for as long as my tanks run. Next is probably one of the most important features on this bus. It's this uh, deer whistle here. It's supposed to repel deer on the road when you drive by. I'm not entirely convinced it works, but I put it there for my mom. Let's check out the inside. Oh, coming in, you'll see the wolf dog herself. That's her favorite spot. Um, she likes sitting right next to me when I'm driving, and I like it too. So in my bus, I kept the front portion stock. I originally just did this because I thought it was cool. Um, I like the school bus aspect. I originally had two rows of seats in here for friends. Um, I later removed one of the seats to accommodate more snowboards and bikes because um, I liked using this as my mud room and kind of as my catch-all for as I walk in the bus. And then I still have two seats back here with seat belts as well as a jump seat up front for a co-pilot, even though Kiara can't sit up there. I have a backup camera on this. The screen is right in my sight of view. So I do use that when driving and that way I can see if people are tailgating me, if I should get over. The only things I really added to the front were the backup camera and the jump seat, as well as a few outlets so that I can have my cooler up here when I want to I've had this rig for roughly three years and in using it in that time, I did add a lot of stuff. So if you were looking to know what you might want in your rig, um, I would definitely recommend cup holders, simple things, but having cup holders everywhere for your passengers or for you, that's nice. Extra outlets to charge phones, um, have them by different passengers so that they don't have to charge their phone by putting the cord across view on the dash. Um, as well as the little spots put knickknacks. So I put um, wall hanging baskets everywhere and that's a really nice way to you can set um, maps and hand sanitizer or um, whatever you might want while on the road there. Um, you get a lot of travel brochures if you go to national parks and things like that and you just kind of want a good spot to put things. So baskets, phone chargers, cup holders, and then making sure that all your seats are actually safe and having a seatbelt for all of your passengers. Um, that's huge. And even on the jump seat here, making sure to have a seatbelt. On the inside of the actual build, I did remove the ceiling and the walls and I re-insulated the whole thing because I wanted an R value of at least um, 10 to 15. So I use mineral wool, which is probably still um, second best, in my opinion, first best, obviously being closed cell spray foam done properly. Second best, I would do mineral wool. I would not do Havelock wool, sheep's wool, things like that. It's a crappy R value. Um, you're still going to have condensation. You're going to have a ton of moisture. That stuff is eco-friendly and a fun idea, but not entirely practical for a winter rig. And the worst option, don't keep your bus insulation for an actual three seasons rig. Because up here, where I keep the original, kept the original ceiling and walls and all the windows and the window treatments, it gets hot up here, just like a car. In the back where it's insulated, even though I don't have an air conditioner, when I have the blinds closed in the windows, it stays cool in there. And um, you do want that in the summer. So coming through, you'll see that there is a divider wall I did this to make sure that um, if I didn't put everything away when driving and if I did have to slam on the brakes, I don't have a bunch of stuff slamming forward into the driver's area. That just wouldn't be safe. Also, really easy way to insulate. You lose a ton of heat at your windshield or where any glass is for that matter. So I put in two by four walls here, um, super beefy, super insulated. And then I went ahead and sewed together two thermal curtains for the front door. I didn't want a bulky door. I just wanted something to keep the heat in and these do a great job. Walking in, um, the first part of my build is the kitchen dining area, kind of social area. And I wanted enough room to cook as if I was at home. So I wanted a full oven range combo. I wanted a deep sink. 
Um, I wanted a full fridge because I did intend to take lengthy trips in here and I didn't want to sacrifice on eating. I love cooking and I love having space for it. And I love having space for all my spices, all my pots and pans, and really not sacrificing anything because I think this kitchen is better equipped than my one at home. On the other side, I got a, or I made a bar top table. Um, I just went ahead and used a um, alder slab. This was actually a reject from a local mill. It's slightly curved, but I thought it was kind of artsy in that fact. So I stained it and I made a form for the rear and then I filled it with rocks from my driveway and then did like about 10 layers of epoxy. It was a fun project. It came out really nice and it's a great spot for when I was working from the road. I do do a lot of consults for wolf dog buses and most of those I'm sitting here for them. Under it, I made a quick, easy fold up table or shelf rather. And I made it to accommodate the, um, those common target fabric boxes. Really easy way to stow extra stuff, especially when I have a friend coming on a portion of a road trip with me and they have extra stuff to put there. I always leave that open for them. My bench seat, pretty standard slide out like you'll see in a lot of other rigs. It slides out this way and that way to make a giant L. I did that so it's roughly a narrow twin size and you can fit a fitted sheet around it and let someone sleep there. I did do all these cushions myself and after several tries I found my favorite way was making them um, full boxes, um, same fabric the whole way and zippers. And then when you're making your cushions make sure they fit for multi-purposes. So these guys, when it's really cold and someone's sleeping here, they can lock the windows with them. And as silly as that sounds, it makes a huge difference because um, when it's negative six degrees outside, even though these curtains do a good job of maintaining the heat in the rig, it will be cold by the curtains. And this keeps it from being drafty for passengers. Um, Fridge. So I have enough space for it in this rig. I went for the apartment size 10 cubic foot. This is a Furion Arctic. Love this fridge. When they first came out with it, they had a couple issues to work out. Like they had the fuse in the rear, so you had to remove it if your fuse had issues. They now wire them to the front. That's awesome. It's 12 volt only, super efficient. I also use the Furion. Uh, oven range combo and this was one of the first models to have self-igniting. I also did epoxy for the countertop so this is actually just a high-grade plywood with eucalyptus leaves glued in here. Um, yes I glued each eucalyptus leaf by hand. It took forever but it turned out pretty cool and I like it. I just used angle iron on the front and painted it black and I figured just in case my um, dogs wanted to be bad and jump up here, they wouldn't scratch it or mess up the edge of the counter. You'll see my cabinets. These are not custom cabinets. I ordered these from a cabinet supply company. They come in pieces, you put them together. I did make the mistake on this build and these are frameless three quarter inch. So it makes them incredibly hard to lock with like child locks or the push buttons and so I actually had to go ahead and install a little hook up here and then I do bungee cords from here to the bottom um, drawer and then I have a little boat latch under the oven and that latches up to that drawer so that when I'm driving they are actually secure and don't slam open while driving. Every build I've done since this I go ahead and do recessed cabinet doors and little hook latches to positively secure them while driving. That was a big lesson learned on this guy. These look really nice and they're great when stationary, but when driving, you gotta pull the bungee cords out. On this, I knew that storage was gonna be a big deal, especially if I was full time. So I added cabinets wherever I could. These are six inch slides. You can just purchase these, these are Reva shelf, six inch slides. They're awesome. They fit um, five inch mason jars or different kinds of containers. 
and then I have little boat hooks to hold them in place. Uh, for the closet, instead of doing doors, I sewed um, uh, fabric curtains, and then I used little button snaps to hold them in place. And I did this because doors would take up a bunch of room as you open them, whereas the fabric just kind of tucks to the side. And yeah, and it looks kind of cute. It's an artsy way of doing it. And then I have hanging space. I have spots to set stuff. I have additional drawers underneath. And then a tall cabinet as well. And you'll see that there is a safe for all your valuables at the bottom, as well as I put like a little necklace hanger up top. And what's cool about schoolies is when you're building it, you really feel like you're allowed to kind of do whatever with storage and you can just screw in those extra shelves and really cater it to what your needs are. Like, is there something specific that you're going to be storing all the time that you want a nice spot for? And uh, you can go ahead and put that in. That being said, when I saw there was a spot in the wheel hump, that the box that I built over the wheel hump, I definitely added a little tiny wine storage spot and people ask me if I use that yes I do I went ahead and match the door to my um, bathroom door too which is just a raw three-quarter inch piece of plywood and I just thought it was a pretty piece it had nice markings and I love the look of the black metal on raw wood so incorporated that and through here is the bathroom, which I probably went a little above and beyond compared to what I thought I was originally going to do. I really wanted a nice spot to shower, and this is predominantly a snowboarding rig for me, so I wanted a bathtub to where I could take my Epsom salt baths after a long day, and it has been awesome for that. I went ahead and took the pipes from my heated floor, and I wrapped them around the tub so that the bathtub is heated as well kind of figured why not it's my bus and I can do what I want to it so that was super nice and I used a horse trough so that it is a small narrow tub but it's big enough to fit um, my 70 pound dog in there and give her a bath and um, when she's being crazy and shaking all over the place it doesn't matter because the entire bathroom is waterproofed um, for this build I did just use peel and stick tiles I added an extra adhesive to them. They did a great job. It's been four years. I have had one of them fall off by the toilet and I put some more adhesive on and glued it back on. Um, no big deal because the entire bathroom behind the peel and stick tiles is waterproofed. And I did make sure to do that because I did not want any water issues in my bus. Um, I went ahead and did PVC tiles on top of the shower because I do have cedar ceilings and I didn't want them to get totally saturated. So that was a nice easy way to clean the ceilings. And I put the vent fan in there to keep moisture levels down when taking hot showers. So I said I would talk about it and here we are. I started with an Eco John, Tiny John incinerator toilet. And uh, I thought it was a super neat idea because they made a propane 12 volt option, which meant that the flame and the heat came from propane and the ignition came from 12 volt as well as the computer and display. The unit was awesome when it worked and it would take about, I think it was 15 minutes for a urine cycle and 40 minutes for a combo cycle. It didn't smell like much, they were correct on that and it was pr pretty quiet and it gave you just a tiny little bit of ash to dispose of. It, was virtually zero waste. It was pretty awesome. The issue was um, every single time I took my bus on the road, something would shake loose on it, something would break, and I would have to fix it. I fixed the um, display, I fixed the computer, I fixed the uh, igniting system, I fixed the airflow control, I fixed the uh, burner itself. Pretty much everything there was to fix on it, I fixed it and fixed it twice. And then after talking with the EcoJohn company themselves down in Little Rock, 
it seemed like this toilet was just not yet developed enough to be in a mobile application. That if you wanted it mobile, you really had to do the electric version, not the propane. Um, and that meant that it wasn't really off-grid capable because as you're probably aware, a electric component that generates heat takes a lot of electricity and a lot of battery power and a lot of solar power. So when you're trying to use an incinerator that's full electric, it's not gonna happen unless you really have a substantial solar system or you're hooked up to shore power. That being said, in the Pacific Northwest, with not a lot of sun and not wanting to invest that much more money into my solar system, I opted for a compost toilet and nothing can break on a compost toilet. It's a glorified bucket. You separate solids from liquids, nothing can go wrong, and you're good to go. That was super nice after um, experiencing a toilet where I was concerned whether or not I'd be able to use it, uh, and then going to one where no matter what, it's good to go. There's something to be said for simple and reliable, and that's what compost toilets are. Uh, so that being said, the compost toilet I went with is a Sunmar GTG. You'll hear me talk about those a lot. They don't have an agitator. You just simply put a bag in the solids compartment, and when it's full, you take it out and throw it away. People are like, hey, but it's compost. Why are you throwing away trash? Well, compost takes about a year to actually turn into dirt. Until then, it is still waste. And so if you use a compostable garbage bag and you throw that in the garbage, you're still doing a bit better than um, other options. And if you're using this rig as a weekender or um, traveling and not really living full time off grid in the middle of the woods, something like a nature's head where you're using the agitator and having to take the entire unit out of your rig to go clean it isn't really practical for most people. So I like the Sunmar, simple, easy, nothing to break. I don't have to take the whole unit out to clean it. Yeah, definitely sticking with that one now. Moving on to the bedroom area. I kept my bedroom area simple. I have a queen size bed, I have shelves, and then I also wanted an additional sink. So um, for getting ready in the morning, brushing my teeth, I have a personal sink back here. Someone else can be using the bathroom area. I put outlets on both sides because I didn't know which side I'd want my head at and maybe I'd want to charge my phone or have a projector going. So 12 volt, 12 volt outlets are everywhere in this rig and every rig I built after this just because um, you don't know where you're going to want it until you're living in it and it doesn't hurt to have extra. I also have my fresh gray water uh, tank level indicator up here. Um, this unit is not great, and I'll just say that. The only tank level indicator I've seen that actually works really well is the C level indicator. They're a bit pricier, but they work, and they're stick-on um, strips that go on the side of your tank. Uh, this guy just always has issues. The sensors are internal to the tank. They get gunked up. Uh, you will get slime buildup in your tanks and it's not accurate. Uh, the pump switch does work and that's nice because I can turn my pump off at night or when I'm not traveling for a while, but yeah, that's my little water system control unit. Um, in the back you'll see, so yeah, this is my snowboard rig and my main snowboard stays uh, back here because uh, it looks cool and it's a good spot to keep it out of the way. The shelf over here uh, is my dog's sleeping spot. That's why it's giant. And then this center part that's got the cushion on it actually folds down into a bench seat that goes out the rear. Um, that was supposed to be for tailgating. I didn't end up using it too much, but it is nice to use as a hatch into the garage. And I can kind of check on things or look out the rear window if um, I hear something outside at night. It's just always nice to have access to the garage from inside. On the other side, you'll see an additional thermostat, and that is because uh, my heating system in here has two zones. 
I heat the bedroom and bathroom independently from the kitchen area. Yeah, so that aqua hot that I talked about that I absolutely love, super bougie. And I have two climate controlled areas because why not? Uh, above me is a marine hatch skylight. Uh, it's a 24 by 24 inch skylight, I believe. Um, this is pretty much your best option for an openable skylight in your bus. I wanted this because I wanted to make sure that I do have an emergency exit on the top rear and front of the bus in case of an emergency. And also because it gives me private access to my roof deck, which how can you have a schoolie without a roof deck? Let's be honest. Coming up, a recent add I did to this roof deck um, to make it easier to get into or out of it is I added a marine ladder. And it collapses up and down and then you can climb right out of here without pulling yourself up. And this is the 10 by eight foot roof rack system made exclusively for strapping down equipment and absolutely not made as a roof deck as RVs have for sitting at racetracks and hanging out on top of them. Up front you'll see the solar rack which houses my I think it's 120 watts of solar. It's a ZAMP solar system. I went with ZAMP because they are American made. Um, the company is in Oregon. And for this bus, I did want to try and source as much as I could that was USA made. I thought that was really cool. So these decks are made with uh, conduit. The front is half inch conduit, the rear is three quarter inch. And I angled them so they'd go into the roof and I screwed in, well, rather bolted in the top three. Uh, it's a great system, super sturdy. I used Unistork going across, so it'd be low profile. That means that my entire bus still only has a total height of 10 foot six, which is incredible because if you want to ship this bus, it does ship inside of a um, uh, shipping truck rather than having to pay extra for special shipping. So that was something I thought about. And then you can see the max air fan on top. Pretty standard schoolie roof, very usable, very functional. Um, and it's nice to be able to get up here easy, especially when you want to clean your solar panels and make sure they're performing at their uh, their peak performance levels. Ready. So the aqua hot in this bus, um, not many people do these. I don't think many people know about them when converting to schoolie, but it is a rather expensive component. However, it is one that I would not do without in a rig now. Uh, it is basically a diesel boiler that maintains a vat of antifreeze at 180 to 190 degrees and every time my thermostat in the kitchen or in the bedroom trips it goes ahead and turns on a recirculation pump and that recirculation pump pumps antifreeze through the floors in that zone and through the heat exchanger in that zone it brings it up to temp within like third i don't know 30 seconds to a minute it's quick and then um the thermostat realizes that it's the right temperature and it uh, turns off that recirculation pump and that zone's good. That vat is always maintained at that temperature. So the aqua hot does turn on even though it's say 70, 80 degrees outside. But it is nice because it's always ready to go. If you want to turn up your temperature inside or if you want to run hot water, you don't have to turn your rig on. Like so in the winter I generally use this for about a week at a time snowboarding and then I come home and work and when I go to leave for my trip I don't have to do anything I just like stock my fridge bring my clothes in and go I don't have to turn the heat on I don't have to make sure it's working I don't have to think about any of that stuff and I don't have to winterize I don't have to blow out water lines I don't have to pour antifreeze anywhere um, it's just ready to go. And if you're from a colder climate, you realize how nice that would be. Coming from Michigan, we had to winterize everything down to pressure washers so that they wouldn't freeze and lines would break. Um, my bus, no matter where I go, I'm fine. 
Uh, so that aqua hot is super, super nice. It gives me those heated floors and I can actually use them. I've seen a lot of examples of people putting heated floors in their bus, but then running them off of the onboard coolant, which is great when you're driving. Um, but if you're not turning your bus on for a half hour for it to come up to temperature, you're not using your heated floors. And then if they run them off of a propane system or something else that's really fuel hungry, um, again, you're not going to end up using them. You see those people commonly install Chinese diesel heaters and then predominantly use that, which is kind of a waste of all that hard work putting the PEX in. Um, anyways, yeah, Aqua Hot, Rixen, whatever system you want to use, if you do want heated floors and you do want to be off grid in colder climates, it's an awesome way to go and your bus feels warm. It doesn't feel drafty. Um, big thing in making it feel homey. I really like that. Uh, my dog, however, being a Malamute Arctic wolf, does not like it. She likes the cold ground, so she goes up front where the floors are stock and they're freezing in the winter. <laughs> so she still has her spot. Uh, another thing is uh, with your bus, I always suggest personalizing them as much as you want. Put the fun things in. So I put l track on the, cur the upper part of the walls by the curve, and I use those for hammocks. So if I have more than a couple of friends staying in the bus with me, I can hang up to two hammocks uh, diagonally through the kitchen and they can sleep up there. Uh, that's worked out great. It's a super fun spot to hang out. I can also use these l tracks to tie down stuff if I'm traveling with a lot of gear. Um, that's nice. I added in rope lights in the soffit area. So if I want blue lights or purple or whatever, if we're watching a movie at night, I can turn those on. It's kind of fun lighting. And then, I don't know what else. I did a lot of personal touches here. I have like my glass pasta containers tied to the wall and I Velcroed them so they wouldn't break while driving. And honestly, I, I kind of thought they were still gonna break because it's really thin glass, but they haven't, they've held up and I love those. All right, someone's gonna mention it, so I'm gonna talk about it. Bus windows. Yes, there are better options. No, you don't have to get rid of them. I kept everything I could stock on this bus because I thought it was cool. I think it's cool. Um, the bus windows give you a ton of light and I love the pain in the butt they are to open and close. It reminds me of going to school with my friends in the morning. Um, I don't know. They hold a special plate in my heart, place in my heart. I like them and I wanted to keep them. I don't regret it. Um, the biggest thing if you're keeping them, have proper window treatments because any glass, whether it's bus windows or fancy RV windows with tints on them, will feel hot when the sun's on there and they will have the magnifying glass effect where there's a ton of heat inside because of the glass. Um, having the curtains completely prevents that. And then also when it's really cold outside, this gives you an air gap, which helps insulate and keep your heat inside. So I had absolutely no issues. I camped down to negative six in my bus. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't see any buses or RVs staying where I was staying off grid. So um, the windows is not the determining factor. Uh, when I built this bus, I did consider the fact that they're going to leak because bus windows are basically designed to leak. Uh, they did a terrible job cutting out the sheet metal and just bending it and having this huge slit on both corners where water can just pour in. So what you got to do is you got to keep up on the caulk on the outside. And then on the inside, I went along the hat channels at the floor and I drilled a hole and that allows the water to drain out rather than pool in the floor. Um, yes, that will eventually rust 30 years down the road. I'm okay with that hole rusting. Um, I built this bus to be able to withstand flooding. So I have the holes drilled at the bottom of the windows for leaks. And then say I have a water tank explode. I um, went ahead and drilled holes in my floor at the corners of the framing so that water that gets down into the floor has an escape route. Um, that's huge because otherwise, if you have a major plumbing leak in here, you would basically have to take up your entire floor to dry everything out. Um, so I built to um, prepare for worst case scenario, probably because um, I was coming from being a nuke in the Navy 
and we plan for plan A, plan B, plan C, and we have safety features on safety features on safety features. So that's kind of the mindset I had with this bus, and I'm glad I did because um, I haven't had any issues yet, and I know that if I do, there's a plan B, and there's a plan C, and there's a way to fix everything. So yeah, super cool. On that note, you'll see I have super beefy windowsills. I went ahead and built out my walls with two by fours, and I did that so I can do a ton of insulation, and I have an R value of 15 on my walls. Um, this is not only nice for keeping heat in, but it's also nice because I have a little bonus shelf at all of my windowsills, and I use it all the time. You can set cups there. Um, when I'm working at the bar top table that's pretty narrow, I can set my drinks, my phone, whatever I want up there, and it's worked out really nicely. So let's take a minute to talk off-grid. Um, a lot of people use the term off-grid and it gets thrown out and around a lot, but um, I want to talk about what that means to me and what I talk to um, other bus builders about when we reference off-grid capable. Um, so it can mean a bunch of different things. And first, I always start off by asking, where are you using this rig? Are you going to hot climates or are you going to cold climates? Are you chasing 70 and 70 degree weather? Um, because if you're staying in hot, hot climates and wanting to work inside and have air conditioning, you're going to need, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 watts of solar up top and a big old battery bank to accommodate the nights. If you're like me and you're going to winter climates, you have an aqua hot, and when it does get hot, you go to a lake or you go to a river and you're not just sitting inside at the best part of the day, um, then you don't need as much to be off grid. I run roughly a thousand watts up top and about 300 amp hours usable battery bank or 3600 watt hours because I have a 12 volt system. And that is excessive for me. Um, I barely ever run my battery bank below 70% capacity and um, I keep it as warm as I want in here. And when it gets hot, I turn on the fan, open the windows. I'm super comfortable. Um, that being said, I also live a minimalist lifestyle when it comes to cooking. I don't use an Instapot, I don't use a coffee maker, and I don't use a toaster. Um, I'm more than comfortable using a kettle on the stove and cooking in the oven, and that keeps my power consumption way down. If I do want to use a toaster, I do have one on here, and I plug it in and use it in the morning for breakfast, which works out great because then I got the sun up all day to charge up the battery bank and it's kind of like night or it's uh, I compensate for my heavy usage in the morning by having the sun throughout the day um, that's really important because people don't realize in having an off-grid system they not only need something that is capable of filling their needs but they also need to be able to live a lifestyle that suits that system because no matter how much solar you have, no matter how many batteries you have, you can always overload that system depending on how you're using it. The last systems I want to talk about are safety systems. So no matter how sure you are of your electrical connections and everything else, you always want to make sure to have smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors on board. Just that last surefire way to know that you will wake up if anything goes awry and that when you're cooking on a propane stove, you know when your carbon monoxide levels are getting high and you know when to turn your exhaust fan on to make sure that you are safe and healthy. So summing up this tour, this is obviously my personal bus, my first bus, and will always be my favorite bus. This has brought me so much joy. I absolutely loved building it and I loved using it. Now that I've been in this industry for uh, more than a few years, I do a lot of consults with people and a lot of them, quite frankly, are based around motivation and can I do this? Am I capable? Um, like what does it take and can a, can a female do it by herself? Can, can one guy do it by himself? Like, hey, I'm 16 and want to do this or hey, I'm 75 and want to do this. Um, quite frankly, if you want to do it, you can do it. Um, especially now, there are so many how-to videos. Chuck Cassidy's got all of his incredible videos out there. Um, you can see examples of what to do, what not to do, 
And if you want to make it happen, you can make it happen. Um, personally, I uh, converted this bus nearly entirely by myself with the occasional help by friends, but mostly they were just holding a beer, kind of laughing at me at the side, wondering what the heck I was doing um, and keeping me good company. I was getting out of the military, so I was still working full time and did this in my off time. It took me about a year, um, but I will admit that I'm a little crazy in that regard. And I committed all of my free time to this bus because this was my main priority and I had fun doing it. And my friends were willing to hang out with me in the bus, building the bus. So I still got to be a little social while I was doing this project. This allowed me to do exactly what I wanted to do. I got to travel, um, bring my whole house with me. I got to go to the ski resort and stay there for weeks on end. Um, Crystal Mountain knows me as the bus girl. I think that's so funny. Um, my dog absolutely loved it. I had space to travel with my dog. Um, I had done the whole sleeping in my truck bed before this. And while that's kind of fun and cool once or twice, it gets rolled real quick. Um, and my dog did not like it as much. Whereas here, she's got room to sleep. Um, I can bring her food. She's got her space. And then um, in the morning, she wakes up to see where we're at. And if we're at the ski resort, she loves running around in the snow. And if we're at the beach, she can go swim. So yeah, bus life is a lot of fun. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't know where your motivation lies, don't do it because it is an undertaking. It does take a lot of effort. You are gonna make mistakes um, and it's gonna be a journey. But if you want it, go for it.